Make friends for yourself by the means of dishonest wealth coming straight from the mouth of our Lord and Savior. What? Now this particular parable comes only from the Gospel of Luke, and yes, it is an odd one. And of course, the question arises, well, how have others preached this? What have the commentators over the centuries thought of this passage? All the classic questions that, that a preacher asks. And finally, in my prayerful and sometimes desperate discernment, I seemed to hear a little voice that said something very simple that turned the parable completely upside down. And that very simple thing was, it's all dishonest wealth. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, our Lord and Savior had a little spice to him, a little sense of humor. Maybe not all of his parables need to be taken at precisely step-for-step -step face value. Maybe sometimes he's using tools like humor and irony to drive a point home a little sideways because it's hard for us to hear it directly. Maybe he's saying it's all dishonest wealth. <coughs> there is no such thing as honest wealth on this side of the mortal veil. So the question is simply, how do we relate with, take care of, be stewards of the dishonest wealth? So here's what I mean by it's all dishonest wealth. There's many narratives in our culture, all of which end up resulting in rancor and division. And they all center around the question of whose wealth is honest and whose wealth is dishonest? Who earned it? Who got it unfairly? One of the classic narratives is, hey, some of us really pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. We worked hard in school, we got a good education, and then we worked hard on our jobs. We made that money honestly. Now look at all of those people who are leeching on the system. The welfare recipients, the, the ones who just make a quick buck at somebody else's expense. Now that's not fair. My wealth is honest, theirs isn't. Us, them. There's that one, right? There's another one. It's almost 180 degrees inverted from that one. There's the, look at all these privileged elite people who grew up at homes and took really good care of them, the parents who had a certain amount to invest in their education, uh, not only money, but also time and guidance. And, you know, they went to these elite colleges and got these fancy degrees, and then they got these fancy jobs, and they're going around saying, they earn it all by themselves, and I'm calling nonsense on that. That's just privilege, and actually, my, the two cents that I made begging on the street is more honest than the million dollars that they made and they claim that they got it from their hard work. Us, then. I can list many other narratives like that, but they all end up having the same result. It ends up being a big scuffle over whose wealth is honest and earned, Whose wealth is dishonest and unearned, and it divides us into us and them. But my friends, let's think about the core of the Christian message. Spiritual wealth, if we really believe the gospel, is always unearned. There's no such thing as honest spiritual wealth. The core teaching of our faith is that what saves us what sanctifies us is the grace of God in Jesus Christ alone. It is a free gift given by a God who is just profligately generous and loves us and wants us to have much more joy and prosperity than we can ever claim to deserve. Well, if that's true of spiritual wealth, isn't it possible that it's also true of material wealth? I mean, if we take enough time and we're honest enough to dissect the source of any material wealth, 
somewhere in the chain of events that got it to us or to another person, there was a gift in there somewhere. It might have been immediate, it might have been somewhere back in the history of it, but somewhere there was a gift. And if anywhere in that chain there was a gift, can we really say, hold myself up to my bootstraps and I earned it, this is completely honest wealth and it is mine by right? No, my friends, I know it's a tough pill to swallow, but we can't say that. Every piece of wealth we possess, be it tangible or intangible, be it spiritual or material, is a gift. And hence, I think, in a slight, humorous, ironic twisting of the words, it's what Jesus was referring to as dishonest wealth today. So we're all simply being stewards of dishonest wealth. And I think this parable is meant to break apart all of those rancorous narratives, all of those things that divide us into us and them, and simply put us all in one boat. We're all being stewards of dishonest wealth, and we're being asked to do it as faithfully and as well as we possibly can. And perhaps that's as simple as enjoying what we have and disciplining ourselves not to begrudge others what they have, and not spending a whole lot of time and effort trying to dissect how we got ours and how they got theirs. It's really pretty simple if you look at it that way. But there's one more aspect to this. Because he does talk about the true riches. He does talk about the heavenly treasures. And perhaps another thing that he's pointing out to us is the more time and effort we spend arguing about the earthly treasures, which ones were earned, which ones were honest, which ones were unearned, which ones were dishonest, the less space we have to focus on the heavenly treasure. One of my favorite adages is two people arguing about which one is greater is like two grains of sand on the beach arguing about which one's closer to the moon. I think Jesus is getting at that point. He's saying, if you have any bandwidth to worry about your earthly wealth and somebody else's and how they compare and who deserves it more, you're completely missing the point. The heavenly treasure, the spiritual and even tangible things that God has laid up for you, the glory to which you are being moved and called every day of your life and ultimately in eternity is so much higher, so much richer, so much greater than the greatest thing you could possibly imagine. Why are you being mired in these silly arguments that keep you from focusing and dreaming on that? So I think the biggest thing you can pull out of today's parable is a clarion call to keep that beatific vision, to keep that heavenly dream front and center in our minds. Not, as our colleague said, to be anxious about earthly things, <coughs> but to love things heavenly. So if you find yourself mired in concerns about how people got their wealth, how you got yours, how they got theirs, and who can claim that theirs is more honest? Maybe that's actually distracting you from where your mind and spirit could be 